You see, as we look at these numbers and many others that we've accumulated through our research, we know that we've got a problem, a real transformation problem, and we need to address it very directly and very intelligently. Keep in mind that we can simply write it off and say, well, you know, Christians are deceived, Christians are distracted, but I want to tell you we know that it's much deeper than that. We know, for instance, that most Christians in America don't know what transformation is. We know that most Christians in America don't realize that they've been called to live a transformed or a holy life. We know from our studies that most Christians are not being adequately prepared to live a transformed life. And we know that most Christians don't have a clue about how to cooperate with God in that transformation process. You see, and so the result is that there are a lot of well-intentioned, hard-working, church-going, frequently praying, money-giving, volunteering people who you see in your churches week after week who have confused Christianity with religion, who have confused participation with integration, who have confused salvation with transformation, and who have confused holiness with perfection. Those are just some of the ways that they've really missed the mark in understanding what is the nature of their faith and what is the nature of this transformational journey that God wants to take them on. You see, and that's where where we come in. We're blessed with this opportunity, this privilege to be able to come to them and to teach them and to lead them in understanding and pursuing this process. And so we're called to bring them clarity amidst this confusion. We're called to bring them insight to replace the ignorance that they currently possess. We're asked by God to help them understand love so that it can erase the fears that they naturally possess. We're asked to bring them to a place of hope rather than a place of doubt and fear. So where do we start? Well, as I mentioned, we start out by giving them a map. What kind of map? What's the destination? The destination is ultimately their full transformation. And the third question might be, well, as we give them that map, what route should they take? Where do they go? What are the stops along the way that they're going to have to make? You see, and once again, I think this is where the research comes in awfully handy. I've spent the last six years researching this transformational journey, trying to understand what are the stops on the journey. And what we've discovered is that this is a journey that's not short. You don't make it in a day. You don't make it in a week. You don't make it in a month. You don't make it in a year. This is a lifelong, long-term process. And it's a progressive experience when you move from one place of maturity to the next level of maturity as you're striving to work with God to be transformed. But in order to make real progress, you've got to know where you're going. See, the problem is if, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And that's why we have Christians pursuing so many different roads to transformation and making little, if any, progress at all. Let me tell you what I've found from the research are the 10 stops on the journey to wholeness. See, stop one is when we are born. When we're born, we don't understand anything about this idea of sin. Most people don't die still being at stop one. Most of them will move forward at least to stop two, which is where we not uh, only have been born, but now we've come to understand that there is this idea of sin. Intellectually, we come to some knowledge about what does sin mean. But at stop two of the journey, all we've got is understanding. We don't really care at this point about the existence of that notion, sin. Many people, in fact most Americans, will move on to stop three of the journey, which is where as they contemplate the meaning of sin, it begins to bother them. They worry, is this something that could really impact my life? Could this affect the way that I live. Some of them 
will take it to the place of, of faith and religion, and they'll wonder, what if there is a God, and this idea of sin, which is offending God, really is going to impact how he thinks of me and what he allows me to experience and what goes on in my life. A lot of people will then ruminate about that for a while and decide, I need to do something about it. So they continue on the journey and they move to stop four. Stop four is when they decide to pray to Jesus and ask him to forgive them for the fact that they've committed sins against him. They ask him to forgive them and to help them in life. What happens normally is a person who gets to stop four and asks Christ to be their savior almost immediately moves to stop five, which is where you get involved in a lot of religious activity. People at stop five attend a lot of church events. They might read the Bible on their own a lot. They'll pray to God more frequently. They'll give money to religious activities. They may become involved in other kinds of church or religious or spiritual development activities like small groups or Sunday school classes. They may have a private devotional time on a regular basis. All these kinds of religious activities. That's what Stop 5 is about. But here's what I found is interesting. Most people never get to Stop 6. But Stop 6 is the stop of holy discontent. Now, those people who get there usually don't move from stops four and five to stop six until they've been at stops four and five asking Christ to be their savior and being involved in a lot of religious activity for maybe 15, 20, up to 30 years of time. See, they get so enmeshed in what's going on in the church. They get so involved in all the activity and they don't really know where they're going. They kind of lose sight of the big picture. Maybe they never had the big picture. And so in their minds, they got salvation, they think. What more could there be? And so they just do a lot of things that go alongside of salvation, alongside of being a quote-unquote good Christian. See, but at stop six, the Holy Spirit gets really busy and troubles them, troubles their heart and their spirit. And they begin asking questions like, is this all there is? Isn't there more to the Christian life than this? Is this all that Jesus died for? You mean to tell me I've been a Christian for 15, 20, 25 years and it doesn't get any better than this? And and the whole idea of what the Spirit seems to be doing at Stop 6 is to push people to really go back to the Scriptures and to get deeper with God to try to understand what were you put on the planet for? Was it just to go to church? Was it just to memorize Bible passages? No, there's so much more than that. You see, but most people never get there. And a lot of the people that do get to stop six do their due diligence. They study. They try to figure out, yeah, what would be next? And a lot of them realize what is next. Stop seven 